started. So happy Friday everyone and here we are again on another Connect and Share and uh, it's hard to believe we've been through 21. This is our 21st birthday for our Connect and Shares and it's been great to bring you uh, week in reviews every week um, and also some guest speakers on various topics and today we have a great lineup for you as well. But firstly Warami, which is Darug language for welcome and may I pay my respects to all Aboriginal people past, present, future and the emerging leaders in which we'll work with to really edu um, come to fruition with the, the land and what we educate um, in, our, in our systems. So um, thank you again for joining us today. And uh, for those that are new to this, we've got a few newbies and not only our guest speakers, but a few people that um, I haven't seen on our list before. So welcome. And I'm Laurie Mode. I'm the CEO of Outdoors New South Wales and ACT. And you can see why we exist up the top there on your screen, which is about enriching our communities and connecting them with nature to lead more fulfilled, healthier lives. And that is truly what we believe in so that we help you guys in connecting with opportunities, whether it be through events, training, um, advocacy, marketing, um, anything that we can do to make your job a lot easier as we transition through what has been one hell of a year and, uh, and we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, although we would have loved that, that light to come a little bit quicker, but we need to make sure it is light and not a train heading our way. So uh, we've got a few challenges, but um, yeah, we feel that we're very well placed as we come out of the rest of this year into 2021. So the week in review, just quickly, um, a lot more government dis uh, discussions around camps in particular, if you're, you recall, and for those camp providers on the line, it is a real challenging time in which that we cannot seem to get the health department to understand that we are COVID safe. We can conduct our activities without any further risk to what they were experiencing in their own schools. Um, the good news is I've been working with the Small Business Commissioner in New South Wales who is advocating on our behalf now and we're still in discussions with the, the usual people. Um, the latest advice that I received yesterday was it was reviewed in school holidays. Um, I've certainly jumped up and said that's too late. We have literally a week now where we need to tell schools to get back to camp in term four so they have enough time to schedule and uh, put into plans what they need to get back to camp. So um, hopefully uh, next week we'll have more news on that for you. Uh, a reminder on the pricing review, and thank you so much to those that have sent their prices in. You're amazing. Um, this is a really crucial project to really look at our sector in that camp space and, uh, and also match with what the government's doing with their competitive pricing and make sure that they are competitive neutral um, when it comes to their facilities. So please, if you haven't already and you are a camp provider, um, send me your pricing, whatever structure it takes and whatever form you've got it. Um, I will navigate that for you and as I said it's a confidential report I will be sifting through it I will prepare some top line data and share that with you all uh, probably in a connect and share in the very near future um, the board meeting um, happened this week, so our monthly board meeting, and um, out of that I'd like to let you know that we now have a formal risk management incident response group um, subcommittee. So you might remember last week I told you about the, the group that got together and um, it was important to not only protect them but also give opportunity to you as members through that committee and, uh, and they are now official. So uh, welcome to those guys. So I think we've got a few on the line, David Chitty, uh, David uh, Gregory, uh, Brendan Kerr um, and Mark Arundel. So thank you guys for being part of that. If anyone else wants to join that committee, you are more than welcome to come forward and let me know. Um, but uh, really appreciate your time and effort on this. I think you'll produce some amazing things in partnership with, um, with, my with the team here. Uh, Will Kenya, we, we're actually involved in a fabulous project um, that the Office of Sport are instigating and um, hopefully long term will become more of a, a commercial opportunity for, for the outback area of New South Wales. And they put together an amazing Aboriginal program where they're bringing people from the city and, and connecting them with the Aboriginal youth out there on an outdoor adventure. And we know that the benefits are, uh, are huge in outdoor adventure on their own, but to have mixed cultures like this um, is really, really 
really exciting. So I'm I'm dying to tell you all about that when it when it actually goes ahead in October and what the results will be. Um, Crown Lands. I had a great meeting with the uh, the director and the um, strategic planner who has done the strategic plan draft that went on exhibition um, in the last month. And we put in a formal proposal and had a great catch up with them this week. And they've certainly understood um, our position on the strategic plan in opening up more of that nature crown land for activities like we provide. So I'm looking forward to working with them on that as it progresses. I'm going to leave the discussion on TAFE Cert 4. You might remember last week we had a big discussion around, uh, around qualifications and what the sector needed. So I'm going to let uh, my colleagues of TAFE New South Wales take the floor on that very soon. And the other one is uh, we've been busy pulling together some sessions for you, uh, which are small business workshops that we've teamed up with the state government with Small Business Month, and that is October. So please keep an eye out. It would have been on the members newsletter that went out yesterday. It's been in social media um, last night and today. Uh, and we have four sessions to bring you. The first one uh, will be amazing. And if you know the name Paul Wade, um, ex soccer captain and uh, amazing individual, he will will be our guest speaker at our first uh, Small Business Month session on the 7th of October. So it's free, register, it's, it's essential you register because it's not a connect and share login, it's a webinar, so it's a new login. So if you're interested, please jump on and register for those sessions. And as I said, there'll be four and four different links. So um, that's Small Business Month. And don't forget the, the free offers. So some of you have taken up the opportunity with Action Coach. This is the last week we're offering it. So if anyone really wants to have that one-on-one, -on -one, one hour session with Action Coach, please let Leslie know so that we can pass it through to Michael and that way you can hook up your one-on-one. -on -one. And that's a great offer. As I say, the value of that is only $439. So uh, jump at it if you can. And I think we've got Kevin on the line. Um, let me see if I can find Kevin. Leslie's Kevin joined us. There he is, Kevin. Yes. <laughs> I can see him there. Yeah. Okay, Kev Kevin, did you want to talk? Kevin's our, um, our training provider that's providing the infection control training. Kevin, did you want to talk to what you're offering? I don't know whether Kevin's mic's not working or I'm trying, there we go. Okay, so I'll, I just unmuted myself. Okay, there you go, Kevin. Yeah. Um, so that always helps. Yeah, so um, yeah, we're uh, received about 500 places of uh, fee-free um, training for uh, the industry. It's not just the outdoor recreation industry, but retail, hospitality, and the government's really keen to get as much, um, you know, accredited training out there so they've put 500 places up fee free that we've received there's other providers that may have received it as well um, and and what the training um, is focusing on is is looking at the current business plans that uh, organizations might have in place comparing that to i suppose the latest in um, infection control procedures uh, with a focus on covid but you know covering other types of infection and, mm -hmm. and looking at you know some of the products um, that may be uh, yeah, maybe available for the outdoor recreation industry to use that might reduce the, the frequency of which they have to um, you know sort of like clean and sanitize surfaces um, and so we're trying to make it focus for whoever the, the group is to um, contextualize it for, for that industry so ideally for the outdoor outdoor education outdoor recreation industry if we get um, you know cohorts which are all outdoor editors and outdoor um, industry people we can just contextualize the whole course towards their needs and um, so we've got a few courses scheduled in Penrith and Blue Mountains uh, okay. we've got you know, one down in Bega, Cooma, Wagga. Um, but if there was a group um, who wanted the training, we could certainly, you know, schedule another course and go and deliver it at, at their location. 
Okay, great. No, that's great, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here and uh, and just telling everyone a little bit more about it. Um, so if you're interested, uh, you can certainly click on the links that were on the members newsletter uh, yesterday um, or email Leslie and she will connect you with Kevin and, um, and the links that are required. Thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. Yeah, that's okay. Great. Now I'm actually going to hand over to, I believe, Helen and Nerida, who um, Nerida has, has uh, poor thing, has had to handle me for the last week in badgering <laughs> on, uh, on what we're doing with quals for 2021. So I'm going to hand over to these guys and they can announce what's going on. <laughs> okay, thank you, Laurie. Hi, everyone. My name is Helen Cosgrove. So I'm the head of um, the Health, Wellbeing and Community Services Skills Point within Take New South Wales. I'm joined by uh, Laurie, as you said, by Nerida, the Industry Relationship Lead, and also Anne Kintalecki, who's one of my colleagues who manages oh. in Sydney uh, delivery. So thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak with you all. I just wanted to update you in terms of the outdoor rec uh, qualifications. Uh, and so obviously you would know that that is a, um, you know, a transition, well, transitioned uh, training package um, and it's non-equivalent. So what that means for us as an RTO is that we need to go through uh, the full scope application um, in terms of actually getting those qualifications on our scope. Basically means that we're able to advertise the courses and then deliver them. So what my role is in all of that is to make sure that the product so that the assessments and the teaching and learning materials, the RPL, um, all of that area has been uh, developed um, in consultation and collaboration with our industry colleagues. And that's really where Nerida plays a really critical role, um, but also, you know, with our teachers and looking at, um, you know, job outcomes, student expectations, et cetera. So that's really where Anne and her team come in. And um, I should just mention that um, Anne, like I said, Anne looks after Western Sydney, but there's, you know, there's six regions across all of uh, New South Wales within the Take New South Wales framework or operating model. So initially we've been working on the Certificate 2 and the Certificate 3. Um, and that the reasons for that is that obviously uh, many of you will know that um, the Certificate 2, uh, we deliver that to high school students. So it's called the TVEC program. And so students in year 11 and 12 are able to enrol in that course. And so we have high demand in that area. And we also work really closely with um, with uh, the Department of Education around that qualification. So that's been uh, our key focus initially, just to ensure that school students will be able to uh, enrol with us, ready uh, for 2021 study. And uh, that qualifications in terms of the development is well underway. Um, then we've also been working on the Certificate 3, and again, that qualification is well underway. The Certificate 4 in Outdoor Leadership, originally we had planned to develop that ready for a Semester 2 release. However, we understand from industry that there's a real requirement to have that ready for Semester 1. So uh, I guess, you know, that you, um, you have lots of, you know, enrolments or, you know, it, you know, that you'll be able to really support us in terms of um, that. So we're accelerating that development whilst also balancing the Cert 2 and the Cert 3. So we don't have any of those qualifications on our scope at the moment because we do require full product um, and that's where we're working really closely with the regions and also through Nerida with, uh, with yourselves and other industry groups so that we can get those qualifications developed. So I might just ask, sorry? I just, I just said brilliant, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I might just pause there in case um, Anne would like to say anything. I'd really like to, uh, let me first introduce myself, Anne Gunitleka. Uh, I've had a long tenure with TAFE, but, but very closely involved in the delivery of outdoor sport and rec for the past 10, year, 10 years at least, and I have an intimate knowledge of the delivery. I've got a fantastic uh, team of um, teachers and a, a fantastic head teacher who leads the outdoor sport and rec at the Blue Mountains. Um, so I'd really like to, I do understand the, the need, it's a niche market, the, the passion in the industry, but I'd really like to engage more with the industry, to talk to you more and 
also how you can support us in delivery. It's a very specialized area. Uh, it's a group of passionate people, but it's not just the passion. It is about safety. It's about our environment and it's about, you know, a, 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 jobs and proper jobs uh, for the industry. So we would love your support. We'd love to work with you closer. Um, I do get feedback straight from Haley Perro and Adam Darragh, who is an, on my full-time team. So really, I would like to open it for discussion or if you have any questions, of either from the product point of view or from the delivery point of view. Happy to answer questions. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much, Anne. Nerida, did you want to add anything before we get any questions? Sure, look, I'll, I'll just add, hi everybody. Um, I'll add too that um, I'm aware, you know, obviously your industry um, has got an enormous um, shock over the last six months and that continues to be um, tenuous and difficult in terms of uncertainty. Um, obviously now looking to a, a semester one start for um, the Cert 4 is really positive, but Obviously, you need skilled workers early, so you've got no, none of your out overseas um, people coming in. You've lost a lot of your existing trained workforce. So I guess we're also really interested in um, uh, troubleshooting some of that early phase um, requirement as well, because obviously we can't produce a Cert 4 person, even if they start day one um, in semester one, um, that's going to meet your needs. So it is about having an ongoing dialogue, I think, around what we can do to be flexible, adaptable, um, meet the needs of industry, um, particularly in um, hopefully uh, an energised um, uh, first semester um, with a lot of your market coming back. So I, I guess I would just um, add that piece as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Nerida. Does anyone have any questions or raise any want to raise any points in relation to this discussion? I'm hoping they're all just flabbergasted and, and really excited. <laughs> no, okay. I just also, I guess uh, it, it has been a really niche um, area for us. It, the, the enrolments traditionally have been quite small and quite localised, and I guess mm. we hearing from industry that the demand that we should expect is going to be very big and different um, from uh, previous um, years. So I guess we're looking to industry, um, as Anne um, said, to work with us about how we can drive those enrolments for these um, newly um, minted um, um, products as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, was that was something about outdoor skill, uh, a range of skills? Mm. So, sorry, just to uh, okay. reiterate, sure. um, make them understand the modules to get them through. So, if there's certain things that they need, um, uh, if they're, they're needing certain things that they can work with you to get that, that qual um, fast tracked or, or, or worked for their needs, is that right? You want me to respond to that, Helen? Sorry, I actually, um, I don't know if it was my sound or uh, everyone's, but I actually dropped out for a second, so I didn't hear the question, Nerida, sorry. I was just saying, Helen, it was, um, I suppose, when you talk about those little modules that you want to um, establish, first off, it's giving operators the opportunity to get certain um, skill sets ticked off in a, in a more efficient manner as opposed to the whole cert being delivered. Is that what I understand from, from what Nerida was saying with that early... Um, early package? Yeah, so um, I mean, I might go first, Nerida, and then hand over to you. So, I mean, from a product perspective, we have to develop a full qual. Um, so, you know, obviously, skill sets can drop out of that, but uh, but for now, we're focused on developing all of the, the units um, and, you know, across the three qualifications. It's obviously, you know, quite a lot of units. So, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around the electives and the clustering, um, and, you know, obviously, you know, then identifying what of a, um, you know, from from an industry perspective from yeah. um, a teaching perspective and from a student perspective what are those critical electives for us to focus on so yeah. Nerida I'll throw to you yep. yeah so certainly when we were developing the cert 4 we actually have a really extensive elective um, list that was um, agreed to be um, produced so actually quite a lot of the um, electives that are in the cert 4 are being developed um, at the moment anyway but we'll be obviously adding additional um, uh, of those of the skills 
uh, hard skills in the um, Cert for um, offering. So certainly if this group wants to provide some feedback, um, I think we've got a fairly good grasp and obviously we've got people like Simone who's, uh, Simone who's on online, um, a lot of industry people who are working actively in the industry um, and our previous discussions with a lot of mm -hmm. providers about those core things that you need. So I think I'm feeling really confident that we've kind of got those ones. I realise you're a very diverse um, industry and there are people working in niche markets um, and niche skill sets. We won't be able to promise to offer everything because clearly um, each one of those um, is a big piece of work. We've got to have expertise. Um, so, you know, certainly can't promise that everything on that ex very extensive list for Cert4 um, will be developed, but certainly all of those key ones for the majority of the industry um, are absolutely there. But if, if this group, um, particularly now we're moving into the development of the Cert4, um, have some, um, want to have some input into that, that'd be fab. The other thing I'll note too is certainly a lot of the feedback I've been getting from industry has been those requirements for those other skills. So those skills to work with young people, particularly marginalised groups. Um, being able to do um, a better job, I guess, at some of that um, group facilitation and those sort of, um, uh, you know, giving, and obviously I anticipate as you would too, the demands from particularly the school market to, the, to really hit on some of those resilience um, mm. and also some of the, you know, mental health um, impacts that we expect the whole community, but particularly our young people to have um, been, been exacerbated through this COVID period. So yeah. we're also open and very, very interested in working with industry about how we can enhance our delivery options. And this is where people like Anne come in, um, what other electives that we might offer as TAFE more broadly, because we have obviously, um, we deliver, you know, youth work and community services, qualifications, mm -hmm. health qualifications. We have a lot of um, additional um, units that we can actually build and enhance um, an offering to, you know, meet those needs that we're hearing really loudly from industry around those other used to be called soft skills, I think essential requirements, but those other skills to work very um, authentically and effectively um, with, with young people or with groups. I know, you know, a lot of your industry are moving into working with people um, with experience of mental illness, those sorts of things, which are really, um, really exciting. And I think some of those intersex areas that I think um, we have a real opportunity to develop some, you know, really, um, really good products. Yeah, great. Ladies, thank you so much. I know there's some questions around the skill sets and skills area, which, um, you know, as Don said, is a very important consideration. And, and look, I, I welcome the continual dialogue in that between industry and, and yourselves to, to help guide that. Um, any opportunity you, you want, um, come come in on a Friday. We're all here <laughs> um, on te at 10 o'clock. So uh, it sounds like it's a bit early to sort of address those skills area, but um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. And thank you for being here today. Great, thank you thank very you. much. I might, I, it might be opportune, Helen, to discuss the process of what goes in to get a, um, a qualification in scope. Uh, sure, I'm happy to do that. So it is like it is it is industry to understand. You know, it, we are talking about product, but mm -hmm. uh, but getting the product through, and then what happens after that till it goes to scope. Great, thanks, Helen. If you could do it really quickly, that'd be great. I'd love to get on to James very soon. So that'd be awesome. Oh, no, no, that's okay. I'll be super quick. So I mean, obviously, the training package has a requirement in terms of um, a number of units that we need to develop, whether they're core or elective. We then have to develop all of the resources, so assessments, marking guides, RPL, teaching and learning, facilitate, you know, facilitator guides, everything. Um, it all goes through QA, and then it all is signed off by our managing director and goes forward to ASQA. So it's a it's a really significant process, um, yeah. and you know anybody who's you know works in an RTO will will know that. But it's it's certainly not a an easy uh, you know or quick process to do. Yeah. So look, hopefully that kind of covers it, uh, Laurie. Otherwise, maybe just email yeah. me if you've got some specific questions. Yeah. No worries. And I ask anyone if they don't feel like they want to ask now to send me some questions and I'll put it to, to the ladies to, to respond to. So thank you again, guys. Really appreciate yeah. you being here. All right. And all the best with your work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Laurie. Bye. No worries. Bye-bye. Feel free to stick around if you need, <laughs> if you want to. Um, <laughs> so I've got to run. <laughs> okay, no worries. James, thank you for waiting. And look, I, I want to introduce James uh, firstly by just saying um, I think you all understand that what we've been through and the challenges 
that uh, I suppose the peak bodies have had in trying to get some numbers and some data to support our claim um, and, and requests as we go forth with um, the obstacles of getting back to work and back to business. And um, I, I, I've known James in a few previous lives and, uh, and I said to him, here's my issue. And he goes, I have a solution. So I, I wanted to get James on because uh, I think what his product could potentially offer our sector is exactly the sort of thing that we need to start thinking about trying to catch up and on a continual basis. And, and James, he'll talk to what he's been doing, but I'd love you to hear it out. And I welcome everyone's feedback on if they see this as a potential that we could activate for our sector and, and start filling those gaps of the data that we need to really start advocating the best way we can for our sector. So James, I'll hand over to you and I'll let you share away and do your thing. Thanks, Laurie, and uh, g'day everyone. Uh, nice to uh, be in your uh, 21st meeting. It sounds like, um, yeah, some great, uh, it was great listening on that discussion. I'm actually also on the Academic Governance Board at the Australian College of Physical Education. So I know all about the dilemmas that uh, Anne and Narita would be working through at the moment. Um, so yeah, very, very interesting. I'm just going to share my screen and then sort of introduce myself, I guess. Um, so uh, not sure um, yeah, of the, the list of the 30 people on the call today, but um, I've been in and around our industry and sector um, since, since I was 15, working sort of at leisure centres and Actually, when I finished my PE teaching degree, I, I, I almost got a job at Talabudra Creek at the Sport and Rec Centre there, and I wonder what might have been. Um, but I actually ended up moving to Melbourne and, and working for the YMCA for about eight and a half years between New South Wales and Victoria, and, and had some of my uh, light bulb career moments at places like Camp, Ye Camp Menyung and Camp Yarramundi. So um, really interested and intrigued to see if there's a role that the place I'm at now can play um, in helping your sector or your, your membership base um, really present value and understanding. Um, but what I thought today I'd do just for, for 15 minutes is walk you through what we do for other um, parts of our sector, um, what our sort of vision is, and then um, open it up for questions around, you know, could we help and, and is there a role for us in some capacity? Um, but yeah, I'll, look, I'm the CEO of Active Exchange. I have only been in the role for a short time, um, but have been on the client side for the last three years since it came to Australia. Um, so Australian based company um, that has been predominantly partnering with uh, leisure operators uh, sport organisations and local government authorities to really um, create a, a shared and connected data aggregation tech platform. Um, and I'll explain what that means uh, really shortly. Um, but, but I guess in terms of the, the why and, and what we're really focused on is with all the organisations I just meant before, trying to piece together um, insights and intelligence to help buck the trend. Um, I think all of us in, in, uh, in our common field would say that that uh, picture on the left, we would all expect us to be right in the top three James, places. I can't see your screen. Oh, really? Yeah. Let me, I know uh, I can't, can anyone else? <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Let me try again. Uh, share. Can you see that now? There we go. Yep, can now. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry about that. Um, but that picture on the left, I think we would all uh, know that Australia is right up there in um, the issues that face us around obesity and movement. Um, but the picture on the right there is my daughter and her granddad. Um, so Livy's now five, but really, really active young kid. Um, and her granddad being 73 now, really, really active too. And, and has sort of lived a, a very active and outgoing life. He still kayaks most mornings and is very busy uh, being active and chasing Livy around three or four days a week. Um, but he's not the norm. And I think we all know that um, one, in, one in seven people are, are, are over 65 um, and 70% of them don't get enough activity. 
what we're trying to do is across all people in Australia and New Zealand at the moment is really understand what, what would make somebody be more active than somebody else and how do you then understand what to do next to get more people active, more people through your doors, more people into sport and leisure and, and other things based on a series of deep data analysis. So um, then we then start to understand the movement of people through sport and leisure and other things. So um, we're, we're really um, committed to that. Uh, Active Exchange today um, has about 370 sites that track their member behaviour across our network. Um, we've, we have about 16,000 facilities that sit in our um, infrastructure database. And we also have about 70 uh, sporting and government organisations who are somehow connected in and using insights. But um, I guess what I wanted to share is a couple of slides that talk about why and, and how we started and, and we've still got a long way to go. So um, it wasn't that long ago that my desk looked like that on the left there and, and even at the organisation I was last at, which was Belgravia Leisure for the last five years. Um, there's, there's a real challenge that we have in terms of having inconsistent siloed data sets and the things that probably, as I say to you, you would say we're exactly the same and we're all on multiple point of sale systems and we're on uh, different um, platforms and it really makes that really hard to make decisions and actually extract insights or predictions. So in other parts of our sector, being fitness, leisure, aquatics, golf, sport, we've been working really hard to clean up databases. So we don't change databases, we're the intermediary to clean them up. And then we create data standards and start to push those data sets into our platform that then starts to be able to allow us to do predictive modeling. That's the work of a data science team. Um, it then creates um, information that we can sort of better understand why people do what. Um, and these are the things that we've been doing. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples. Um, there's also a real lack of co coordination uh, and, and uh, you know, the sector working together. Uh, and a great example was just, you know, recently in the, the, the construction, and I love this group, the 21 meetings already sounds, that sounds coordinated as a starting point. Um, having left another organisation, you know, it was only because of COVID that an that a, um, a industry alliance was established. They're the sort of things that can really change the game in terms of intelligence and insights and then leading to advocacy and lobbying, the opportunities with collective data, um, you know, across issues. Um, so, so really, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through in a mindful of time, but what we're doing, and, and often people get concerned around data and privacy and, well, how do we do that and why would we do that and why would we collaborate on this stuff. Um, the stuff we're doing ha has been happening for decades. And that's why when um, retail comes through a COVID situation, they can talk about impact and they can talk about future and they can start to lobby and, and demand to get earlier open earlier or have things, restrictions eased. Um, similar to what the work of like CoreLogic would do with planners and understanding what's happening in the, in, in the retail markets. Um, so, so in property markets. So, so that's what's been happening for a long time and, and we're trying to create that for our sector um, and, and move you know, longer term by bringing organisations together and understanding the movement of people through facilities without knowing who they are or what their name is or their email address. It's not about that stuff. It's about moving the right data in and then bringing third party data in that actually starts to better understand the individual. Um, we can really start to drive from a trust us decision based environment to a real evidence based decisions. And uh, I'll, I'll show you some examples of what we're doing with uh, Auckland Council uh, shortly. But this is just an example where in more developed and mature markets such as obviously property and planning and, and others, they're able to really understand the economic value of investment and not just the financial cost, but the potential savings in the future on things like the health burden of Australia. And that's what we've started to do and model through our research. 
Um, so what is what what is what we have? Uh, it's called the Sports Eye Network. So if you look up Active Exchange's website, you'll see we're broken up into four core um, products. Um, one's the Sports Eye Venue Operator. Um, so that's what um, gyms, pools, and and alike would would be on, and they understand based on their member movement what's happening. You know, where are members at risk? What's uh, their pattern of behaviour look like and how do you then get in front of that to make sure they come back, they stay and they stay longer. Um, Sports Eye State and Pro is um, where we work with sporting organisations to understand their um, facilities, clubs and player, player registrations. So we understand the movement of people across sport and across LGAs. Then the Sports Eye Local Government um, module is where we work with local government to understand the movement of people through their venues and the movement of people over boundaries. And they can start to better plan and align the decisions they make next. Um, and then the last one is our sports side business product, which is really um, helping forecast and, and identify commercial opportunities based on all the information we have around supply and demand and provision and future demand. Um, so if you've got a dot in a map, you know, what do you do? What, how, how will it perform? So I know that's quite a quick whip over, um, but just a, a, an example of what we've done with a partner in Auckland. Uh, and we do have industry partners we're working with. So um, Aquatic and Rec Victoria, we've got a really clear partnership with them to understand um, their big swim program and how it's responding to COVID um, once their pools reopen um, and, and other um, industry bodies. But Auckland City Council um, outsource all of their pools to multiple operators and they operate some themselves. So they uh, really wanted to understand how those facilities are performing against each other to help them make decisions around investment. Uh, they don't have an in-house endless function. They want to grow the, um, the reach and the scale of the facilities they have, and they want to understand unmet demand. So where do they um, improve their engagement and communication with community? And they also um, utilise our social value tool to really um, review the value of the leisure assets to go beyond cost to serve modelling um, to then cost to serve to refocus their modelling. So and I'll show you how they, they can do that um, shortly. So the, the modelling that we've pulled together isn't just our data, as I said before. Um, we, we, we bring in a range of third party data, such as Experian data, which puts a, 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 an individual and wraps a whole you know, 950 indicators around them. Um, then we pull in their, their behaviour data. But we've also partnered with KPMG to um, build a social value model that currently exists for leisure sites. We're also doing the same thing now for sport. Um, and we may be able to do other ones for other parts of the industry, should they want to. Um, so they're looking at a particular place for sport and the social value that that sport has on the cost of health investment or health savings. So that, that's very, the reason we chose to partner with KPMG was based on the, the value of community sport infrastructure report they did for Sport Australia back in 2018. So we've then taken those learnings and applied them to our information to build a leisure model that understands the value of leisure facilities. And we're doing the same for, for, for community sport. Um, I'll really quickly whip over this because I'm mindful of time again, but um, there's a lot of deep data analysis that occurs to get us to the place where we put some numbers on a, on a dashboard and, and share information. Um, we look at a whole range of indicators around a, a chronic and acute health care uh, and the propensity of people based on the segment that they are to then suffer those illnesses over the, their lifetime. We look at the cost to support those health issues and we look at then the activities and propensity of activity that can, I, I guess, counteract or prevent those acute and chronic diseases. So uh, there's a lot to digest in all of that and, and I'll probably need to come back and talk more down the track um, if you're interested. But we do look at a whole range of these issues because it then links to be able to tell us, um, based on, again, in a leisure portfolio, 
based on what they do and how long they come and the average time they spend per week and how long they do that for, it starts to really demonstrate value for from a lobbying and an advocacy point of view. So um, the overall approach, uh, you know, we sit down, we look at all the different types of data inputs, we look at all the different types of customer behaviour, we look at how that's tracked, we look at when it's tracked, we then aggregate all that information. We then hand that over to KPMG and they push it into their logic and then they start to be able to then demonstrate um, values based on that information. Um, again, I, I won't dive into this model because there's a lot in it, but really it is based on some significant international research from the World Health Organization, as well as then Australian research that then links to the health portfolio. And so we all know that the, the, the old saying of, once we get these numbers, the sports minister runs over to the health minister and gives them the numbers to tell them what, <laughs> what's happening out there in a preventative world. Um, but we know that the health budget compared to the sport and rec budget is a hundredfold nearly in terms of size and value. So what we've done, we've worked with Auckland Council, we've put their facilities on a map, we've then put a range of data inputs from their point of sale systems across multiple operators again. We've then pushed that into our platform and it spits out a whole range of stuff. And so, you know, from a centre manager dashboard to understand how they're performing, what supply and demand they're meeting through their membership base and what their opportunities are. But the things that really start to get interesting is the health and wellbeing outcomes and the social value outcomes. So that you know, if you're in the platform and that was your business or your network or your membership base as, as an industry body, you would see your dots on a map and you would understand red being good, yet lighter being not so good. You'd start to understand how your sites capture customers now and what the opportunities are. But then as, that, as that's all monitored, we're then able to push that into a health and wellbeing dashboard for Auckland and they can look and compare against operators um, and themselves and understand the impact that, and this is a, a, a demo dashboard, so the numbers are all sort of, um, ignore the numbers, but understand the concept. They're able to look at, you know, across health, addressing inequality, adolescent activity and inactivity, all the site value that they're creating and how they compare to the sector and how that's moving from quarter to quarter. And that becomes quite quite interesting and compelling information when you're looking to fund new or different focus areas or address an issue or, or tackle deprivation. Um, it then pulls further from that into a social value dashboard. And, then, and we heard, I think, earlier um, discussions around the impact on mental health right now. Um, we can tell you that in, in Auckland, 44% um, of their work makes a difference in mental health. And if I was to hover over that on the live dashboard, it would tell you that that's, that equates to $5.7 million a year of mental health impact because of the work they're doing through the ongoing continued programs for the people that come through the doors. Or they would also know that the other main thing that they deliver is um, an increased you know, a, a, an impact of savings in the risk of drowning and all the costs associated with somebody drowning in a public facility. But they're all, and then they can pivot from one to the other. So if you want to talk about a partnership with Diabetes New South Wales, or sorry, Diabetes Australia New South Wales, you can understand based on the movement of your customer base, where you might want to target some effort. And again, you can look at it site by side and aggregated across a, a network. Mm. So there's a lot in all of that. Um, and I'm really keen to get to some questions. But what it then does is at a site level or at a grouped up level is it starts to say, well, what is the social value per person coming through the doors of that venue? And what is it doing per year? And what does that mean across the different percentiles of deprivation? So when you're talking about, you know, um, we need to open our doors because we're having a, we're losing, you know, an impact of X per day we're closed. Uh, and that's a discussion we're having at, with the Aquatics Alliance because of the work we've been able to do for the last couple of years with them in building them into this platform. Um, and we can break it down again by acute or chronic disease. 
So literally just on that, James, so any of the businesses that are on the line, for example, if they were part of this, they can have their own dashboard that says what their contribution to society is of a social and economic level. Yeah, that's right. We would have to obviously, um, it would be a slightly refreshed model because your activities need to sort of dictate and determine the value piece. So yeah. that would be something we would work with our research partners, KPMG, to determine. We're doing the same thing right now for sports. Um, and it's we do a deep dive and really understand the movement of people across those type of sports um, and the retention rates and those sort of things. Um, but yes, absolutely. Over time, once we're, once we're established um, or if we're established. The, the other yeah. piece is um, it, it, depending on your business type, you can start to get some deeper understanding of the different demographics and what they do and how that compares to other um, operators or other um, partners. So this is just an example for a gym, but we're able to understand, deep understanding of you know, how different age groups are coming through and how that compares and what it should be. Um, and then we're able to understand, well, what are they doing at my site and what, what are they doing in the sector? And again, this is all specific to a certain product. So um, what's next? I think um, I just wanted to, this is more um, what, what's next for people when they're in the platform. But the, the, the one, probably the last piece I wanted to let you all know is that the products that we have today and the way it's produced and what you see and dial into, um, it's version 1.17. Uh, it's been a, uh, there was no product two and a half years ago. Um, and, but we've just received a significant grant from the federal government from the Minister of Innovation to completely rebuild the stack. So that means a version 2.0 um, with the whole focus to try and bring the entire sector in on the platform. Um, so that means you know, probably now more than ever is the opportunity to talk about specific needs of specific um, industries within the sector. Um, and that's sort of a, a six to eight month project for us. To comp whilst we've got a product that works, uh, in terms of its scalability and the, um, you know, the, the ability for us to partner more broadly and bring the whole industry along. Um, that's that's, a, that's a, probably a, the next six months focus. Um, just a really last couple of points. You know, if you were to come along um, and you're, a, you're an operator right now, these are the sort of things we're able to produce to help the marketing and growth of the, of the sites. Um, so obviously it's specific to the types of customers, but we're able to look at customers and lifetime value and repeat spends and really then provide that as analysis just to understand who do you really hone in on as a different type of segment, um, where's the opportunity, and, and then that produces a, a whole range of dashboards. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot in that, um, and hopefully I didn't go too quickly, but I was mindful of time, and uh, yeah, just yeah. wanted to open it up to questions. Great, you've got a few already in there. So um, Mark was just um, mentioning something that we actually spoke about, James, but um, Mark said in the ACT, the data um, would be very good to substantiate claim for support because that's something that we're trying to obviously do in this to COVID time. But, um, you know, maybe not an individual business, but as a sector. But um, I think the challenge, and I'll let you respond to that, is probably we need the businesses to be involved so this sector can collect that data. Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe I'll just give an example of another uh, industry body we're working with. So Aquatic and Rec Victoria, who are funded by um, the Office of Sport in Vic to deliver a, a learn to swim program in regional communities. Um, so we're building a dashboard for 70 LGAs to plug in their swim school product to, and they all use multiple platforms uh, in terms of database systems. But what we're doing is creating a central dashboard for that industry body to be able to a help the people operating that product understand how they're rebounding from COVID, but also understand the social impact that that is having so um that's a that's a big example but there might be a smaller pilot example that's possible but yeah you really need to have um multiple um data inputs from organizations to really help benchmark um and and prove Sort of some of the, um, I guess, uh, hypothesis that comes with data. Mm, mm, absolutely. Mark, did that respond to your question? Did you want to ask anything else? Uh, no, that, that's, 
basically what my understanding would be, but I just didn't want to have another subscription to have to fund. I don't mind putting data in. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, as I said, Laurie, there, there might be some static things that we can do in the short term. You know, um, we are, you know, our, the operators that come on with us longer term are subscription based because it tracks data over time. Uh, and that's, that's probably why our, our KPMG partner uh, is partnering with us is because it's not just a one off snapshot. It's actually tracked over time and it changes over periods and, and, the, and, the, and it's the movement of the levers that becomes quite insightful. But that we, we do do one off snapshots as well where we're requested. Mm. And James Warren's uh, got a really important question. Warren, did you want to talk to that? Yeah, I just wonder how long it would take to, to build out the data set that would actually be useful for an industry that you haven't been working in, but such as the outdoor industry. Yeah. Uh, and the second part of that is, you know, I assume you need lots of people participating. So do you, is, does industry fund it or do individual players fund it? Yeah, good, great, great question. I'll answer both and, and again, just use examples of others. So it does take um, a period of time to sit down and understand what your databases look like and where the common threads are, but that is the work of us. So that, that takes, it can take weeks to, to, you know, to two to four weeks to do that process properly. Um, once, once we sort of agree on the starting point and the end point of what we're trying to achieve. Um, we've got the database engineers um, that love spreadsheets and love doing that stuff. That's that's sort of um, an interesting skill set. But it does it, it takes yeah two to four weeks in terms of volume and size. Um, we've done projects with four partners, you know, to just look at a small thing um, with minimal databases, and where the industry has funded it because they've said it's the it's needed and it's the right thing to do or it's been shared as a cost between those four operators. We've got multiple examples like that. We've got you know, the infrastructure database that sits on top of our platform, which we've actually handed over to Parks and Leisure Australia to Auspice for us and help us build this infrastructure network across Australia. Um, that was, that was co-funded by a range of organisations and a range of consultants because they were sick of having to go and pull a, you know, every time they want to do a new place on a map, they've got to go and ring everyone around the network and understand what they have and, and build out a data set that then helps them plan. Well, we've actually done that for them. So yeah, the way it's funded can be varied. It could be a partnership in the industry or it could be a specific number of operators wanting to, to get to a better place. And uh, what you're telling me, James, with, um, with costs, it's probably not as expensive as what people would think. Um, mm. Particularly, you've run a few pilots where, you know, the, the general cost has been quite considerable. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It is. And because as um, firstly, we're wanting to get different um, portfolios onto the platform. So we're doing things with at the moment, we've, we've got all sort of the leisure model has been built. Um, then we've delivered a fitness model. Now we're working on golf and tennis. Um, outdoor recreation would be, again, an interesting one to work through and, and to see how that movement of people then come through other uh, assets. But the, the costs, um, depending on the size of database and depending on the work that needs to happen, you know, we, we've done pilots where the setup cost has been around um, $10,000. And then the ongoing kind of subscription costs, because you need a six month window of time to really run a process. Um, you know, if it's five facilities sitting on that, it's about uh, $500 a month um, per site, you know, yeah. to, to run that model. So if you think about a, a research project that has significant uplift, um, yeah, that, that's, that's the kind of rough figures from a price point. Yeah. And that can be shared through multiple partners, obviously. That's which, right. That's which, right. And there may be ways that you can reach out for grant funding to support something like that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, you know, we've we've worked with, we've just in the midst of delivering something for the Office of Sport, um, where they're taking the lead to get ten sports on the platform and using it across the entire state, and we've done something similar with them. Um, and, and the idea is that they're the lead and they're they're sort of working with the sports to coordinate a data consistency approach 
We then work with the officer sport to plug them into the platform and they become the auspice. It's their, it's really their platform to drive their planning and decision making. Mm. Um, David's got a really interesting point there, James. I mean, can this happen at a national level or is that too broad for for where you're at now? Or, or yeah, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, look, look, I think it definitely can. It'll just be about timing, you know, and what's, you know, uh, yeah. It, it's always good to pilot first because um, working with a smaller number of groups to understand data literacy, data consistency and, and, and applying some standards, that's quite hard to do at a national scale first. Um, but every, you know, if, if national would be the preference and you had a longer lead time, that's what we would need to work through. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, our, our, our goal is this is a, this is an international platform. It sits in Australia and New Zealand right now. Um, so yeah, our view would be to, to connect Australia and New Zealand to the platform longer term, but to start with some, but where it works well is where the cluster of data is within a region or, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, you know, a broad, doing it broadly, the data doesn't really um, tend to talk to each other. So um, Canberra is a good example of a, a pilot opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Okay, great. Um, I think just from my sense, uh, you know, with the frustrations that the Master Jacobs report was amazing and provided so much data about the value of our sector. But, um, you know, as everyone knows, it was done in 2016. So the, the data now is so out of date, not only with COVID, even pre-COVID, it was out of date. So it's, this is literally for me, um, having access to on the spot data as required. And as Helen said, you know, great for grant applications or assessing new program development um, opportunities for the sector, which is exactly right. Thank you so much, James. Does anyone want to ask anything else before we let him depart? <laughs> I think they've all written down their, their comments there. So thank you so much, James. Really appreciate you being here and, uh, and for giving this to us. I think um, Noel has some general discussions with anyone who wants to potentially look at this and, and see what sort of opportunities there might be out there to help fund fund it, whether it, I might hit up Office of Sport for us to be one of those 10. Um, but uh, we'll see how we go with that. Thank no, you again. Okay. See you later. Guys, we've got three minutes left. So um, does anyone want to bring up anything that they've uh, discovered during the week or any issues? on the horizon or any opportunities? Hi, Laurie, it's Simone. Hi, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, guys, I just wanted to tap on into what um, the folks at the higher level way above me that spoke about TAFE before. I just wanted to also let you know that we tentatively got some funding for semester one to run some uh, free statement of attainment courses in some of those skill sets that will sit in like canoeing, bushwalking, climbing, abseiling, mountain biking. One thing that we've, and I've sort of approached this with my supervisor, one of the things that we've discovered, and you probably will find this as you're rebooting, is that the rusty nature of students or staff. So we went through that period of no programs from um, March till July, and from July, till today we've run 42 field excursions or field trips um, just to get our, our students uh, to be able to graduate and one of the things we just noticed was that lag in time with just them not sharpening their skills so to speak and they're not having that opportunity so one of the things is there is some uh, funding that will sit at TAFE for revitalizing the industry and even though we can't formally advertise it at this stage don't worry as soon as it happens I'll let you guys know and um, we can take down some names. Wonderful, that's really great news. Thank you, Simone. And um, yeah, thanks for, for uh, also your support in the last week and a half. <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> great, um, any other questions from anyone um, or any other comment? I've got to tell you, our time management in the last few weeks has been outstanding. Look at that, 10.59 and we're finishing up. <laughs> so I'll let you get to your next appointment. Thank you all for contending this week and we'll see you next week. Take care.